Now coming up on our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1189 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal supports amateur radio at the recent Senate confirmation hearings. The U.S. Senate confirms FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel for a new term to head the FCC. The November Volunteer Monitor Program Report has been released. We will tell you who has been naughty and who has been nice on the bands. A new grant from the ARDC, the Amateur Radio Digital Communications Group, will expand a Rocky Mountain Radio Club's 5 gigahertz microwave network throughout the southwest states. A new AMSAT satellite group has been formed. We'll tell you where. Japan will be launching the world's smallest moon lander, and they are looking for reception help from amateurs. And one radio club in the Northwest tried to file for a low-power FM broadcast station to which the FCC said no. We'll tell you why in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, takes another look at how the worldwide chip shortage is affecting cars and trucks and how it has postponed the release of new gear from Apple. He'll also touch on the new bills in Congress that propose to break up large tech companies. Australia's own Anil Benshoff, VK6FLAB, takes an overall look at the special art of getting started in amateur radio. We'll hear the latest statistics and latest happenings with Park on the Air and Summits on the Air coordinator Vincent O'Keefe, N3FEM. Our own amateur radio historian Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill begins the first of a two-part series on the history of amateur radio repeaters. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, takes a look at the safety precautions you should observe when climbing your tower. This week, he looks at tower belting. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Windy, Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting this week from my home studio in Cortlandville, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from a cold, damp Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where Mother Nature seems to have lost autumn altogether and replaced her with spring. Wow. Just wow. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off the news this week, Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut received an affirmative reply from Federal Communications Commission Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel when he asked her to commit to providing his office an update on the steps that the FCC is taking to support amateur radio operators. The Senator posed the written question as part of Rosenworcel's renomination hearing conducted by the Senate Commerce, Science and Transportation Committee. Blumenthal took note specifically that radio amateurs voluntarily provide an array of public services, especially emergency and disaster-related support communications when infrastructure has been destroyed by a hurricane or similar disaster. Their contributions in this area are regularly recognized by local and state authorities. AWRL is grateful to Senator Blumenthal for his support and recognition of radio amateurs said AWRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR. Blumenthal has previously co-sponsored legislation supporting amateur radio, and his staff was recently briefed by AWRL on pending amateur radio matters at the FCC, Roderick added. 
We need the partnership of the FCC and Congress to ensure our rules and spectrum continue to support the march of technology innovation in our vibrant amateur radio service. Multiple proceedings to update or change the FCC's Amateur Part 97 rules to account for changes in technology and operating practices have been languishing at the FCC, some going back five or more years. ARRL is hopeful that these will be addressed soon. The United States Federal Communications Commission gained its first woman at the helm on Tuesday, December 7th, as lawmakers overwhelmingly confirmed her nomination. The U.S. Senate confirmed Federal Communications Commission Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel for a new term at the FCC on a vote of 68 to 31. President Joe Biden appointed Rosenworcel as chair of the FCC in late October. She has been serving as the panel's acting chair since January. The FCC will continue with two Democrats and two Republicans led by Chairwoman Rosenworcel. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, previously reported that Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut had expressed his support and recognition for radio amateurs during Rosenworcel's renomination hearing. ARRL is hopeful that multiple proceedings will be addressed soon to update or change the FCC's Amateur Part 97 rules to account for changes in technology and operating practices. The chairwoman said in a statement after the Senate confirmed her nomination, people across the country count on the FCC to support the connections they need for work, learning, health care, and access to the information we require to make decisions about our lives, our communities, and our country. I look forward to working with the administration, my colleagues on the commission and FCC staff, members of Congress and the public to make the promise of modern communications a reality for everyone, everywhere. The nomination of a fifth commissioner remains pending before the Senate. Last week, the Senate Commerce, Science and Transportation Committee conducted a hearing on President Biden's nominee, Gigi Sohn, for the remaining Democratic seat. Committee and full Senate votes on her nomination have not yet been scheduled. This is the November 2021 report of the Volunteer Monitor Program activity. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. Operators in Ardmore, Tennessee, Lithonia, Georgia, Coconut Creek and Miramar, Florida, and East Bridgewater, Massachusetts were issued advisory notices regarding excessive bandwidth contrary to FCC rules. The operators were transmitting on SSB with bandwidths of 8 to 9 kilohertz. Advisory notices were issued to operators in Northridge, Los Angeles, and Hemet, California, for interference to repeaters. Both operators had been requested by the repeater trustees to cease using the repeaters. The advisory notice issued to the Northbridge operator cited broadcasting and failure to identify, and it informed them that the FCC was requested not to grant their upcoming renewal application unless the case was resolved. An advisory notice was issued to an operator in Powell, Wyoming, for transmitting overdriven FTH signals that resulted in spurious emissions. The operator has since corrected the problem. General class operators in Bartonville, Illinois, and St. Clair, Michigan, were issued advisory notices for operation in the amateur extra class portion of 40 meters. A technician class licensee in Winbur, Pennsylvania, was issued an advisory notice for operating in the general class portion of 75 meters. One case was referred to the FCC for enforcement action and review of a license renewal application. The FCC referred two cases to the Volunteer Monitor Program. Totals for VM monitoring during October were 2,939 hours on HF frequencies and 3,282 hours on VHF frequencies and above for a total of 6,221 hours. That is the highest number of hours monitoring since the inception of the Volunteer Monitor Program. We thank Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator Riley Hollingsworth for this month's report. The German regulator, Bundesnetz Agentur, more commonly known as Bnetz A, has banned the sale of the Test 4 Model 6 robotic vacuum cleaner because not only did it use lasers to chase after your cat or dog, but it also sported a wireless link, complete with a networked remote control. 
It came into circulation without a CE mark or any other appropriate paperwork regarding the wireless elements of the design. So the Test 4 Model S6 is no longer going to be doing its rounds. While we radio hams could smirk about that, the same BNET say has recently struck much closer to home and banned the import, sale and use of the popular Baofeng UV5R dual band handheld. Several amateur radio news outlets reported speculation that this may lead to a ban across the whole of Europe. Informed postings on the EI7GI blogspot confirmed problems that Polish authorities found in tests conducted on the imported UV5R radios. Their transmitted spectrum is just not clean enough. The Polish regulatory authorities informed their German colleagues, who in turn quickly announced this ban. A grant of $375,000 from Amateur Radio Digital Communications to Rocky Mountain Ham Radio will go towards expanding a multi-state 5 gigahertz microwave network to help outfit communications trailers. For more details, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this report from the Southgate News Service in the UK. The microwave network enables partnering amateur radio clubs and groups to access, enable or expand their repeaters and other appropriate applications. The network provides 50 to 100 plus megabits per second of bandwidth and is managed and monitored by a dedicated network operations team. The Rocky Mountain Group said that the amateur radio organizations across Colorado and New Mexico will use this infrastructure to enable their own repeater and IP capabilities that would otherwise be difficult or prohibitively expensive to achieve. In Colorado, Rocky Mountain Ham Radio will be able to grow its microwave network by 23 new microwave sites and 20 new point-to-point -point spans to expand IP connectivity and future repeater coverage across the western slope of Colorado and along the interstate highways I-70 and I-76 into eastern Colorado. In New Mexico, the microwave network will grow by 16 sites and 15 new point-to-point -point spans to expand IP connectivity and future repeater coverage south from Albuquerque to El Paso, Texas, along the US Route 550 to Durango, Colorado, and across the Rio Grande Valley to Alamogordo, New Mexico. The club will also expand digital repeater coverage, either DMR or DSTAR, depending on coverage gaps across New Mexico, through the addition of seven repeaters co-located at their proposed new microwave sites. As a result of the grant, the Rocky Mountain Group will also be able to upgrade its Colorado Communications Trailer, which offers both RF and IP connectivity, and to fit out a new trailer for service in New Mexico. You can read more about this on the ARRL website at www.arrl.org forward slash news. The microwave network enables partnering amateur radio clubs and groups to access, enable, or expand their repeater and other FCC Part 97 appropriate applications. The network provides 50 to 100 megabits per second of bandwidth and is managed and monitored by a dedicated network of operations teams. Amateur radio organizations across Colorado and New Mexico leverage this infrastructure to enable their own repeater and IP capabilities that would otherwise be difficult or prohibitively expensive to achieve, a representative of the Rocky Mountain Ham Radio Group said. In Colorado, Rocky Mountain Ham Radio will be able to grow its microwave network by 23 new microwave sites and 20 point-to-point -point spans to expand IP connectivity and future repeater coverage across the western slope of Colorado and along the I-70 and I-76 corridors in eastern Colorado. In New Mexico, Rocky Mountain Ham Radio will grow its microwave network by 16 sites and 15 new point-to-point -point spans to expand IP connectivity and future repeater coverage south from Albuquerque to El Paso, Texas, along U.S. Route 550 to Durango, Colorado, and across the Rio Grande Valley to Alamogordo, New Mexico. The club will also expand digital repeater coverage, DMR and, or DSTAR, depending on coverage gaps across New Mexico, through the addition of seven repeaters co-located at their proposed new microwave sites. As a result of the grant, Rocky Mountain Ham Radio will also be able to upgrade its Colorado communications trailer, which offers both RF and IP connectivity, and to outfit a new trailer for service in New Mexico.
The Amateur Radio Community welcomes its newest amateur radio satellite organization, which joins Germany, the UK, and other nations serving the ham satellite community around the world. AMSAT HB, the newest amateur radio satellite organization, came into being on November the 26th in Switzerland. With the help and guidance of AMSAT DL's President Peter Gultzo, DB2OS, the group will promote amateur radio service via satellites in Switzerland and around the globe. Credited with suggesting the formation of AMSAT HB, Peter led the founding meeting virtually from Hanover and has been granted honorary membership. The new officers include President Michael Leap, HB9, WDF, and Vice President Wolfgang Siedler, HB9, RYZ. The organization has applied to be affiliated to the USKA, the National Radio Society of Switzerland. The ARRL Executive Committee met recently in virtual session with President Rick Roderick, K5UR, presiding. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more about the Executive Committee meeting in his report from ARRL headquarters. In his report, CEO David Minster, NA2AA, said ARRL is expecting an increase in the price it pays for paper effective in February 2022. He said it's not yet clear whether the impact of the increase in paper costs would be short or long term. ARRL FCC counsel David Siddall, K3ZJ, discussed recent efforts at the FCC and on Capitol Hill advocating FCC action on long-pending proceedings that address amateur radio concerns. Siddall also addressed new legislation pending before Congress that would set deadlines for the allocation of additional spectrum below 3.45 gigahertz to commercial 5G providers. He described ARRL's efforts to obtain support for allowing continued sharing below 3.45 gigahertz on a non-interference basis. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. In this report, Chief Executive Officer David Minster, NA2AA, noted that the revised ARRL Articles of Incorporation approved during the July 2021 board meeting had been filed with the state of Connecticut. He also discussed the delayed timing of the delivery of the December issue of QST. He advised that members should expect to receive their December issue about a week late. CEO Minster reported he had met with the ARRL Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, on October 22nd at Bradley International Airport near Hartford, Connecticut, to observe ARRL participation in an emergency management exercise that concluded on October 23rd. Walters, on behalf of the ARRL, participated in all three days of the exercise. FCC Council Seidel noted an FCC Notice of Proposed Rulemaking in PS Docket 21-346 looking into ways of improving communications resiliency and recovery during hurricanes and other disasters. He said the ARRL had submitted reports to the FCC staff during and immediately following Hurricane Ida. Seidel further noted the progress of the ARRL's RF Safety Committee in addressing and clarifying issues concerning amateur compliance with the FCC's RF exposure rules and appropriate updates to the related FCC bulletin. He concluded that the work of the committee, under the leadership of Greg Lepin and 9GL, will benefit every amateur in the future to more readily assess RF exposure compliance and to make any adjustments needed. West Gulf Division Director, Executive Committee Member, and Chairman of the Legislative Advocacy Committee, John Robert Stratton, N5AUS, updated the Executive Committee on the status of a resolution introduced in Congress by U.S. Representative Debbie Lesko of Arizona to declare April 18th as National Amateur Radio Operators Day. Director Stratton also advised the EC that the Legal Structure Review Committee was reviewing the Articles of Association, Bylaws, and Standing Orders with an eye toward recommending any needed changes at the January 2022 board meeting. The Executive Committee meets again on December 13, 2021. 
Amateur radio is a hobby that is often thought of as being exclusive to those with a healthy expendable income. In recent years, however, the tides have turned. Cheap microcontrollers and signal generators have helped turn things around. And the $60 QDX from QRP Labs goes even further by sending the performance price ratio through the roof. In a Hackaday article, the QDX is described as the creation of Hans Summers, who is well known for producing affordable, high-performance amateur radio kits that are focused on low-power transmission, which is called QRP in ham radio parlance. So what's in the box? Well, it's a pocket-sized, four-band, software-defined radio using 80, 40, 30 and 20 meter amateur bands. And it's designed to be used with some of the most popular digital radio modes, FT8 and JS8 Call, as well as many other FSK-based modes such as RITI, that's Radio Teleprinter. It's also been tested to work well and within specification on the 60 meter band. While classic radios have to be connected to a computer through a special hardware interface, the QDX is designed to connect directly to a computer through a standard USB A to B cable. Connections for rig control, transmit receive switching and audio are all handled directly by the QDX and there's no need for a special interface. While the radio is essentially plug and play, configuration, testing and troubleshooting can be done by connecting the QDX's unique serial console, which amongst other things contains a text-based waterfall. For those who want to run their own SDR receiver, an output known as IQ can be sent directly from the sound card. Now for the bad news. Due to global chip shortages, the QDX is out of stock at the moment and there's no telling when they might start shipping them again. QRP Labs is looking to source parts wherever they can to get more of the units made, but of course so is everyone else right now. You can read the article and watch a video about the new transceiver at hackaday.com. A replica 1BCG transmitter will be operated as W2AN stroke 1BCG on or about 1820 kilohertz on CW from the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum of Connecticut. We're using type 204-A tube, said Mark Ertel, AE2EA of the Antique Wireless Association. The original transmitter used type 204 tubes. The primary difference is the 204-A tubes had a thoriated filament that reduced the filament current. Transmissions from W2AN stroke 1BCG will be one way, just like the original transatlantic tests in 1921. For more details on the 1921 transatlantic tests, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. As most of you know by now, December 21 marks the 100th anniversary of the reception of a transatlantic ham radio signal. Various on-air events have been planned, and I hope you will have or did get involved. Clark Burgard, N1BCG, who styles his call sign after the 1BCG call sign used to transmit that signal from Connecticut to Scotland, spoke with Steve Ford, WB8IMY, on ARRL's Eclectic Tech podcast. We brought you a snippet of this last week as Burgard explains this time the success of the transatlantic tests marked the beginning of the end for the spark gap on ham bands and advanced the technology to CW. They heard a lot of spark stations. They heard CW stations actually much better than they heard the spark stations, which is one of the reasons why they, the jet or Paul Godley was on a campaign after this to say, hey, listen, this spark stuff is just it's not working out. You guys really need to get over to CW. It was much better. But, and this is where the big moment is, at 252 GMT, the first message was actually sent. And it was, number one, this is 1 BCG, words 12, New York date 11 12 21, to Paul Godley, our dross in Scotland. Hearty congratulations, Burgard, Inman, Grinnan, Armstrong, Amy, and Cronkite. And at that moment, Again, 2.52 in the morning, GMT. It was technically, this is now December 12, but in the U.S. it was December 11. The successful transatlantic test marked the birth of both DXing and DXpedition. Clark Burgard and 1BCG spoke with Steve Ford, WB8IMY, on ARRL's Eclectic Tech podcast earlier this month. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME.
An SWL certificate is available by emailing a copy of the transmitted message. Transmissions start on December 11th at 2300 UTC, continuing every 15 minutes until December 12th at 0400 UTC. In a separate event on December 12th at 0252 UTC, the Radio Club of America's W2RCA will make a one-way transmission on 1825 kHz at 12 words per minute on CW from Connecticut. RCA members constructed the original transmitter and shack used in Connecticut for the successful transatlantic transmissions. In addition to the original 1921 message, a new message will be transmitted that looks ahead to the next 100 years. Those who copy the message qualify for a certificate. The AWRL and the Radio Society of Great Britain, or RSGB, have assembled a list of stations and groups that are organizing events and activities to celebrate 100 years of amateur radio transatlantic communication. Visit these two URLs. I'll give each one twice. Get ready to copy. HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.awrl.org forward slash transatlantic. Again, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.awrl.org forward slash transatlantic. And the second one, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash rsgb.org forward slash transatlantic dash tests. Again, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash rsgb.org forward slash transatlantic dash tests. The sites also include links to many previously published articles and presentations covering the historic tests. Japan's Omotenashi, the world's smallest moon lander, will have an X-band and UHF communication system, although it will not carry an amateur band transponder. With more information on how amateurs can become involved in this low-power moon lander project, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. Awatanashi is a six-unit CubeSat set for launch via a NASA SLS rocket as early as February 2022. It'll have a mission period of four to five days. Wataru Tori of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency Ham Radio Club, JQ1ZVI, said radio amateurs can play a role in gathering data from the spacecraft. The spacecraft is made up of two separable components, both having independent communication systems, an orbiting module and a surface probe. The orbiting module will take the surface probe to the moon. It'll transmit beacon or digital telemetry data on UHF 437.31 megahertz. The surface probe, the moon lander, will transmit digital telemetry or three-axis acceleration analog wave with FM modulation on UHF, the frequency being 437.41 megahertz. Transmitter power in both instances will be 1 watt. As Tori explains, we already have a station for uplink and downlink at Wakayama in Japan used as an EME station. However, if the satellite is invisible from Japan, we cannot receive the downlink signal, so we need a lot of help from ham radio stations worldwide. The orbiting module will transmit on 437.31 MHz using PSK-31, the surface probe, will transmit on 437.41 MHz using FM, PSK-31, and PCM, PSK, PM. Contact Tori for more information. The email is tori, T-O-R-I-I dot W-A-T-A-R-U at jaxa, J-A-X-A dot J-P. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The name is an acronym for Outstanding Moon Exploration Technologies Demonstrated by Nano Semi-Hard Impactor. If we succeed in receiving the UHF signal from the surface probe, we could know the acceleration data on the impact on the moon and the success of the landing sequence, Tori explained. Tori noted that the RF system on the lander only operates on UHF. Those frequencies once again are the orbiting module beacon will transmit on 437.310 MHz using PSK-31. The surface probe beacon will transmit on 437.410 MHz using FM, PSK-31, and PCM, PSK, PM. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I used to listen to when I was a kid. 
from a lot of my life, my early life, and that's probably why I got into radio, I used to uh, lie in bed late at night and listen to the radio. Did you do that? I used to listen to baseball games. I remember in 1969, I was lying in bed and uh, we lived in Rhode Island and I was hearing about all the kids. I was 13. I was hearing all about the ki all the kids going up to Woodstock, how the roads were jammed. And I was thinking, I wish I were going to Woodstock. Then I used to, you'd have to do it at night because I... Uh, you could oh, you couldn't quite get it, but I used to tune in W O R in New York and listen to Gene Shepard late at night. Great, the great radio legend. Then later, uh, when I was in college, I would actually get up, and this is for a college kid unusual. I would get up at six in the morning, didn't have class, but I wanted to listen to Imus in the morning on uh, W N B C and Reverend Billy Saul Hargis and all of the characters he used to do in that. But I think that's you know what? Now that I think about it, that's probably why I got into this business. Let's see, what happened this week? Uh, just saw a story in the IEEE Spectrum. Yeah, I read stuff like that so you don't have to. The IEEE, which is the, um, what does the IEEE stand for? You know, that's a good question. The International Engineering Electorate. It's, a, it's an engineering group. And now, now, I'm, now I'm curious. I don't see anywhere on their website where they say what it is. It's the world's largest technical professional organization for the advancement of technology. Advancing technology for humanity. I probably used to know what it stands for. I don't remember. Anyway, I saw, that's, that's neither here nor there. Because I saw an article on the IEEE Spectrum, which is their magazine by Robert Charette, how software is eating the car. The trend towards self-driving and electric vehicles will add hundreds of millions of lines of code to cars. Can the auto industry cope? Just to put it in perspective, hundreds of millions of lines of code, that's how many lines of code there are in Windows. It's that it's on that level of sophistication. I'm sure Sam's been talking about this all along, but it's, it's kind of stunning and, and it's relevant right now because it, according uh, to analysts, the chip shortage, the global chip shortage is being felt everywhere, but it's especially being felt in cars. 4.1 million autos won't be made this year because they can't get the chips. That's a lot. 10 years ago, only fancy cars had microprocessor control units. Today, fancy, fancy cars like the BMW 7 Series may contain 150 electronic control units, pickup trucks, like the Ford F-150, 150 million lines of code. As of 2017, some 40% of the cost of a new car can be attributed to semiconductors. The cost has doubled in 10 years. And they think by, uh, by the end of this decade, it'll be 50%. Each new car today has about $600 worth of semiconductors, 3,000 chips in it. So it's no surprise. <laughs> I mean, your steering is controlled by a chip. The, the doors, the windows, the mirrors, the seats, the climate control, of course, the anti-theft system, the keyless entry system, even the steering column has a computer on it. That's fascinating. And uh, that chip shortage is felt everywhere. You know, I think Apple, I, now that I think about it, well, on Monday Apple had an event, and uh, you might have remembered that last week I was pretty confident in my expectation they would announce new laptops. They didn't, even though I think they really meant to because the... Uh, on YouTube, where they put the video of the keynote up, they somebody made a mistake. You know, they put tags in like Apple and, you know, iOS 15, which they talked about Mac OS Monterey. But they also put in the tag M1X, which doesn't exist. That's what some have thought might be the name of the next generation of Apple chips. And even MacBook Pro M1X. They thought, whoever wrote those tags thought, oh, they'll be announcing the new MacBook Pro. Clearly, they've got it. But I'm thinking that their plans to announce it, this would be a logical time to announce a laptop. This is when purchase decisions happen for kids going to college, going to high school in, in September. This is when people start thinking about that. So you want to get it out right now. You know, it's almost now going to be too late. But I'm thinking they, they, they wanted to, but they couldn't because chip shortage, chip shortage. Now, there's no shortage of Apple's own M1 chips because they bought up all the production <laughs> of a big Taiwanese manufacturer. I don't think they're having problems with that. But remember, if a car, if your car has $600 worth of chips in it, more than a thousand chips in it, just imagine what a MacBook has in it, right? There's other chips too that control all sorts of things. And I think even one little chip, maybe the chip that controls the display, you could, if you couldn't get that, you, the whole thing would be up in smoke. And I think that's what happened. That's my guess. 
So for those of you, I said, wait, don't buy anything from Apple until after uh, June 7th. Go ahead. Go ahead if you can get it. I don't know. Uh, honestly, I just don't know what the plan is now. You don't want to introduce a laptop in July or August. They could. I mean, Apple can do whatever they want, obviously. Maybe, maybe they're going to scramble and have it out in a couple of weeks. Uh, that's completely possible. But I'm thinking now we're not going to hear about new hardware from Apple until uh, September. So go ahead. If you need it, buy it. Nothing should slow you down. If, if, if you can get to find a car, buy it. Go right ahead. The house is coming down on big tech. It's all coming to a head. You might have you might remember last, uh, was it last year? I guess it was all the executives of Google and Microsoft and Apple and Facebook all testified. Actually, Microsoft didn't go, I don't think, but everybody else testified in front of the House Antitrust Committee, the House Judiciary. After 16 months investigating the, quote, business tactics of companies like Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google, Congress has issued, the House has issued five bills with bipartisan support to regulate the tech industry. This all came out on Friday. One bill would empower the Justice Department or the FTC to break up tech firms by forcing them to sell off parts of their business if there's a conflict of interest. Another bill bars companies from giving their own services preference over their rivals. Yet another bill blocks companies like Facebook from buying up little companies that might be competitors like, oh, I don't know, Instagram and WhatsApp. So that's the three that are maybe going to be a little controversial. The, the other two, last week the Senate already passed a measure, Amy Klobuchar's Senator Klobuchar's uh, measure that would boost merger filing fees for large companies. That money goes to antitrust enforcers to investigate. So they're trying to beef up enforcement. A similar bill was introduced on Wednesday that would force platforms, Facebook, Apple platforms, to make data they collect interoperable. That's a fancy word the tech industry uses to mean I can read yours, you can read mine. Why is that important? Well, so you're not stuck. So you, if you go all in on Google, you can make, take it all and move it to another place, to Apple's iCloud or to Microsoft's OneDrive. Data portability, they call it. Five bills. All of a sudden, it's like, whoa, they got busy. 16 months of investigation. Now, they've, now the other shoe drops. That'll be, uh, we'll watch with interest. I have mixed feelings. On the one hand, you know, the benefits of the tech industry have never been felt greater than during this pandemic, right? Imagine the pandemic if your kids couldn't go to school using Zoom or Google Classroom, or if you couldn't go to work remotely. Many people couldn't, lost their jobs, could have been far worse. We, we owe a lot to tech, but at the same time, uh, I understand people are afraid. Some of it is, oh, they're just too, too rich. They made too much money. I don't like that. They're too rich. Cut them down to size. But some of it is they're too powerful. And it is true if you think about it. My friend Amy Webb calls it the big nine because she includes some Chinese companies in this. In fact, she wrote a book called The Big Nine, The Tech Titans. This was actually a couple of years ago, but uh, it was, well, she's a futurist, so it was ahead of its time, right? Uh, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Google. Those are the American ones. But then she throws in, oh, and IBM. Then she throws in Alibaba, which is a Chinese company, and Baidu, and Tencent, which you might know as the owners of TikTok. So those nine are are really dominant in our society. They've really changed our society. My my fear is I'm not sure if Congress is, has a, a sharp enough scalpel to really figure out what to do with them. I hope the patient survives the surgery, I guess I'm saying. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Repeaters, it seems they are everywhere and they are. Several thousand amateur repeaters operate on our bands from 29.5 megahertz all the way up through the microwave range. In fact, there are more amateur repeaters in the U.S. and Canada than there are AM broadcast stations. How and when did this evolve? 
let's take a look at the development of repeaters in the amateur community. If you had a guess when the first repeater came on the air, what would you say? 1970? 1965? 1955? Try 1932. It was in the early 1930s that the first duplex phone relay stations, as they were then called, came into existence. W1AWW and W1HMO set up a manned relay station in a 90-foot wooden lookout tower near Springfield, Massachusetts. They used a super regenerative receiver tuned to 60 megacycles, the top of the old 5-meter band, and a modulated oscillator transmitter on 56 megacycles, the bottom of the band. Stations in Connecticut, Massachusetts, or Rhode Island could transmit on 60 megacycles and have their signals manually rebroadcast on 56 megacycles. This relay station, of course, was in operation only when amateurs were on duty at the lookout tower. Fully automatic repeater operation was still over 30 years away. In the 1950s and early 1960s, there were a few AM repeaters on the air in California. But, for the most part, VHF operations of the 1940s through the late 1960s were on AM phone in the simplex mode, with a handful of sideband stations thrown in. Using crystal-controlled transmitters with about 10 watts and single conversion super hets, the typical VHF operator had a range of 10 to 15 miles, not counting any band openings. There were a handful of FM stations, of course, but the development of FM as a mainstream amateur mode of communication had been pushed aside by sideband. As early as 1940, QSD had construction projects for a complete 112 megacycle FM station, but then FM took a back seat in 1947 when sideband appeared. Now, however, thanks to an FCC edict, it was about to make a comeback. In 1960, the FCC issued new requirements for the users of VHF commercial frequencies. Over the period from 1960 to 1970, commercial users gradually phased in narrowband 5 kHz deviation equipment to replace the wideband 15 kHz transceivers that they had been using. Rather than revamp the older equipment to meet the new standards, they simply purchased new radios. The old radios made their way to the surplus market, where they were quickly snapped up by amateurs. Converting this equipment to ham frequencies was relatively easy, and soon hundreds of stations were operating on 52.525 megacycles and 146.94. Why those frequencies? Well, 52525 was the lowest 6-meter frequency on which wideband FM was allowed, and 14694 was chosen to accommodate technicians who weren't allowed above 147 megacycles. Thus, these became the first calling channels. It wasn't long before some surplus commercial equipment was revamped into repeaters. Unlike the 1932 setup, these were fully automatic devices with no need for a control operator to be present. This, however, presented problems. Part 97 at that time contained no provision for repeater operation and it was unclear as to whether it was legal to operate a repeater without a control operator present. Many proposals were presented to the FCC to clarify the rules in regards to repeaters. FM and repeaters received considerable publicity in 1969 when Hurricane Camille caused widespread destruction in the Gulf Coast in Virginia. This was the first time mobile rigs, FM, and repeaters were used extensively in an emergency. FM activity increased in late 1969 and early 1970 with the ARRL's announcement that it no longer considered technicians to be just experimenters, but rather full-fledged communicators. Also adding to the popularity of FM was the introduction of the first commercial rigs for the amateur market, from manufacturers such as Galaxy, Clegg, and Drake. By 1970, it was clear that coordinated legal growth of FM and repeaters was necessary. In early 1970, the FCC proposed its first repeater rules. They were as follows. On 6 meters, repeater inputs would be from 52.5 to 52.7, with the outputs at 53.0 to 53.2 megahertz. For 2 meters, 
repeater inputs would be authorized from 146.3 to 146.6, and the corresponding outputs would be from 146.9 to 147.2. On our 220 band, the input-output subbands were 223.1 to 223.3 with the outputs at 224.1 to 224.3 and on our 440 band repeaters would be authorized on 447.7 to 448.9 for inputs and 449.1 to 449.3 for outputs by the way it looks like the 1970 FCC proposal contained a typo in the 440 megahertz band segments Whistle on or other coded access would be required. Carrier activated repeaters would not be allowed. No crossband, linked, or chain repeaters or multiple outputs would be allowed. The maximum power permitted would be 600 watts input or about 400 watts output. And finally, the FCC declined to allow fully automatic repeater operation. The proposed rules required that the licensee of a repeater station to be in attendance at the transmitter or at an authorized fixed control point and to monitor all transmissions of the station. The proposed repeater rules appeared unduly restrictive to many hams. Except for two meters, each band only had a 200 kilohertz wide input-output window. On two meters, the input-output subbands were 300 kilohertz wide but two-thirds of the repeater output subband was above 147 megahertz where technicians weren't allowed. The FCC had still not acted on the ARRL's 1969 proposal to open all VHF frequencies to technicians. When the FCC was questioned on the legality of a technician using a repeater whose input was within the 145 to 147 technician subband, but whose output was above 147, they said the technician operator could not use the repeater. The FCC went on to say, quote, The licensee of such a repeater should sit there with the latest call book showing license class and keep his finger on the no-no button, unquote. And yes, this is an actual quote. So much for liberal repeater rules. Despite the FCC's rather restricted proposed rules, Repeater operations flourished throughout 1970 and 1971. Over 200 repeaters were on the air by 1971, almost all of them in the 146 to 147 megahertz range, so they could be used by technicians. But with the uncertain status of future FCC rules, the lack of national frequency standards, and the inability of technicians to operate the full 2-meter band, a dark cloud hung over the FM world. In our next installment, we will review the ARRL's national plan for 2-meter FM, as well as the revised FCC rules on repeater operation. I hope you will join me. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike, with your month ending November 2021 Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. In Parks on the Air news, as the seasons start to change, we at Poda would like to remind you of two upcoming winter events. The first is the annual New Beginnings New Year Certificate. To earn one of these certificates, simply make at least one contact as a Poda activator or hunter in the first week of 2022. We can't think of a better way to ring in the new year than by doing so with Parks on the Air. Also landing in January is our next seasonal Support Your Parks event. The first seasonal event of 2022 is on January 15th and 16th, which gives you a great opportunity to do some wintertime poda. For those of you in the north, just remember to dress warm, fire up your portable heaters if you're lucky enough to have them, and stay safe. Lastly, be sure to tune in to your favorite ham radio media outlets in early January, as next month's POTA update will include not only the December release, but the year-end summary for 2021 as well. We look forward to having you join us as we celebrate a spectacular year of Parks on the Air. And now for our monthly stats update. POTA had plenty to give thanks for in November. During the month, there were over 300,000 contacts made by more than 1,300 activators. These operators put just over 3,100 parks on the air from 23 different DX entities. The top activators for the month were K4NYM with 4,440 QSOs 
and NG5E who activated 111 different parks. The top hunter for the month was K9ICP with 1,063 QSOs while hunting 770 different parks. In our POTA DX corner, England was our Region 1 leader with just under 1,000 QSOs. Canada was our Region 2 leader with approximately 14,500 QSOs. And Japan was our Region 3 leader with just over 4,500 QSOs. The top DX activator for the month was VE7NB with 1,902 QSOs from 46 different parks. And outside of North America, the top activator was JJ1DQR with 954 QSOs from 18 different parks. For November's bonus feature, we'd like to quickly touch on the community resources that are available to participants in the Parks on the Air program. As Parks on the Air has grown, we've tried to provide some resources to help newer members of the POTA community find their way. The best place to start is to head to POTA.app, hit the menu button, and check out both the frequently asked questions and the rules and conduct. After you've done that, also head to the Community Resources section. Here you'll find both an Activator and a Hunter introductory course prepared by Matt, N3NWV. These are great videos that give a lot of awesome details for activators and hunters in the POTA program. Also in this community resources section, you'll find both POTA activator and hunter PDF guides. These are very detailed and give a lot of excellent information about activating and hunting in POTA, and they're excellent resources to keep with you. Last but not least, we'd like to call your attention to the POTA Slack and Facebook groups where you can chat with other members of the community, ask questions, swap tips and stories, or even just share some pictures of your activations. The Slack and Facebook groups are also the best places to get in touch with the admins and developers in the POTA program, so be sure to check them out if you'd like to chat with any of us that support POTA. This concludes our November 2021 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. Time now for the AMSAV report. It appears that PCSAT, or NO84, has been in the path of some of that space debris resulting from Russia's test destruction of one of its old satellites. So far, there have been no collisions, but NO84's orbit has been decaying from its original 800-kilometer orbit. Judging by what has been determined with other satellites, the end is near. NO84 is getting close to that point now, and Mike DK3WN has predicted the re-entry date as December 26, 2021. What has made NO84 unique is that it had no CPU or operating system. There were two KPC 9612 TNCs, which had chips in sockets. The built-in SysOp feature was used for telemetry, command, and control. NO84 has been in orbit for some 20 years now. It has served the ham community well, thanks to Bob, WB4APR, and his students at the Naval Academy for building such an interesting satellite. The AMSAT report comes to us each week. Courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. It's time to take a look at this week's propagation forecast report, this week provided by Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle. He reports that one new sunspot group appeared on December 4th, but four days later, it was gone. And on Thursday, December 9th, we saw a second day with no sunspots. So average daily sunspot numbers declined from 46.1 to 24.6, and the average daily solar flux went from 90.9 .9 to 82.6. The predicted solar flux over the next month does not seem very promising. The December 9th forecast shows the following. The solar flux will be 80 on December 11th through the 14th, 82 on December 15th, 84 on December 16th through the 17th, 85 on December 18th, 87 on December 19th through the 22nd, and 86 on December 23rd through the 27th. The predicted planetary A and dice is 10, 8, 10, and 8 on December 10th through the 13th. It'll be 8 on December 13th and 14th, 5 on December 14th and 15th, and 10, 8, 12, 10, and 8 on December 16th through the 20th, and 5 on December 21st through the Christmas holiday to the 26th. Foundations of Amateur Radio One of the regular topics of conversation in amateur radio, especially for those new to the community, is where to start. The sheer volume of available options is often overwhelming. 
If you've never encountered the complexity associated with this amazing hobby, the experience can be disheartening and even demoralizing. In my early years, I was results driven, getting on air, making noise, logging a contact, adding a country, winning a contest, rinse and repeat, get better, do more. There have been numerous occasions when I came home from one of my adventures disappointed, sometimes bitterly so. That happened for quite some time, until one day I realized that the journey in and of itself is the reward. That might sound disingenuous, so let me illustrate. This week I set up an automatic beacon in my shack that can be heard by stations around the planet, letting me know just how far my signal can travel at any particular moment, using my own station antenna and local propagation. As projects go, it continues to be an adventure. As you might recall, I like low power operation. Truth be told, I love low power. The smaller the better. Less is more and all that. I recently completed the first leg of a journey to set up a permanent beacon. For years I'd been dabbling around the edges. On the weekend, whilst I was in my shack, I'd regularly set up my computer and radio, set it to whisper beacon, and see what stations heard me. I couldn't turn my radio below 5 watts, so that's what I used. Before you start, yes. I could turn down the volume, but that involves math and I wanted a result. Now. It filled a gap using Whisper, a weak signal propagation reporter like that. For a while, I improved on things by having a receiver set up that monitored the bands all day, every day, and recently I turned it back on, with limited success. More on that shortly. What I really wanted was to see where my signal was going, not what I could hear. I received a few emails suggesting that a Zactec Whisper desktop transmitter built and sold by Harry, Sierra Mike 7 Papa November Victor, would be just the ticket. It's a little metal box with USB and SMA connectors. One SMA for the supplied GPS antenna, used for location and time, the other for a transmit antenna. USB provides serial for configuration and power if it's operating in standalone mode. Yes, you can operate it without needing a computer. And if you want, it does band hopping. After configuring it with things like your call sign and bands, you can plug in the GPS, your antenna, and power it via USB, and it will run as an automatic 200 milliwatt whisper beacon. That device in turn prompted a journey to discover a more appropriate antenna, since my current station antenna uses an automatic tuner that won't get triggered by this tiny transmitter. That caused an exploration in how and where to mount any new antenna, with a side trip into finding a specific anti-seize compound locally. To pick the mounting hardware, I had to get into wind loading, how strong my satellite dish mount might be, how to install and tune a multiband antenna. The list just keeps growing, and that voyage continues. I'm tracking the requirements with a project-specific checklist, just to make sure that I don't miss any steps, and have a place to document new discoveries when they invariably hit me in the face. So far, so good. The Whisper monitor receiver is currently connected to a generic telescopic dipole mounted indoors, which in the past gave me a much better result than my station vertical, so I should be able to keep both running. Next on the list is to construct a live propagation map for my station, then a way to switch modes on that map, so I can tell if it's worth calling CQ without going blue in the face. I'm also working on a whisper transmitter for 2 meters and 70 centimeters, because they are underserved in my neck of the woods. The takeaway from all this is that whilst there are many steps, and truth be told that list is growing as I learn, each step is tiny and doable. The only thing that separates me from someone who doesn't know where to start is this. I started. You can too. Anywhere. Doesn't matter. Pick anything that tickles your fancy. Start digging. It's a hobby, not a profession. Whatever floats your boat, whatever makes you excited, whatever you're interested in, pick it and do something. Anything. That's how you get anywhere in amateur radio. And open source. And life, for that matter. Just start. I'm on a Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The Board of Iceland's National Amateur Radio Body, the IRA, reports that their telecommunications agency has approved a request to renew the authorization for amateur radio use of 1850 to 1900 kHz in 2022, but it will only apply to contests. 
This is a segment of the 160 meter amateur band, also affectionately known as top band, even though there are now amateur allocations at even longer wavelengths. The IRA received the positive response on December the 7th, after requesting renewal of the authorization to use the frequency range 1850 to 1900 kHz for participation in international amateur radio contests in the calendar year 2022. The authorization covers the following competitions. The CQ Worldwide 160m Morse race in January, the ARRL International Morse DX competition in February, the CQ Worldwide 160m Single Sideband Contest, which is also in February, the ARRL International SSB DX Competition in March, the CQ Worldwide WPX SSB Competition in March, and the CQ Worldwide WPX Morse Contest in May. It also covers the IARU HF World Championship in July, the CQ Worldwide DX Single Sideband Contest in October, and the CQ Worldwide DX Morse competition in November. And finally, it covers the ARRL 160m DX competition, which takes place in December 2022. So, watch out for Tango Foxtrot call signs in these contests in an unusual part of Top Band. The authorization is granted with the full consent of the Icelandic Maritime Watch Centre, which has priority for the use of frequencies in this range. The same requirements apply to this section of 160 meters as apply to the existing frequency range 1810 to 1850 kHz, but there are additional restrictions. Authorization is only granted for use during the specified international competitions. Full Icelandic licensees are authorized to use up to 1 kW. Novice licensees enjoy the same frequency rights, but the power limit is based on a maximum of 10 watts. Licensees need to apply separately for authorization to the regulator, but it is sufficient to send one application which will then be valid for all 10 competitions in the year 2022. For more information, go to tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Iceland. According to the BBC, a British aeronautical engineer who has employed weak signal propagation reporting or whisper in attempts to find remnants of a doomed Boeing 777 that crashed in March of 2014 is claiming to have located the missing aircraft. Malaysian Airlines Flight MH370 disappeared into the South Indian Ocean west of Perth, Australia, when it should have been en route to Beijing, and although debris has washed up, wreckage of the plane itself has not yet been found. The engineer, Richard Godfrey, told the BBC recently that his finding, which he believes has at last located the crash site, came through using a combination of Boeing performance data, Emersat satellite data, oceanographic floating debris drift data, and WhisperNet data. German engineer Robert Westfall, DJ4FF, was an early proponent of aiding in the search for the plane using Whisper or weak signal propagation reporting. Although there remain other whisper experts in the amateur radio community who have shed down on the success of this method, Robert Westfall publicly reaffirmed his confidence in it. On December 1st, Intrepid DX Group President Paul Ewing, N6PSE, announced the prize recipients of the second annual Youth Dream Rig Essay Contest. Ewing said all essays received were all unique in thought and very well articulated. Extra points were given for correct grammar, punctuation, and spelling, he said. Most of the essays gave unique perspectives on how to reach out and connect with the youth of today. We will be sharing those ideas in subsequent postings, he said. The first place winner and recipient of an ICOM IC7300 transceiver is Silas Davis, W3SED. Second place winner, Olivia Lee, KD2UYX. And third place winner, Isaac Schmidt, K6IAS, will each receive Yezu FT65R radios. Having read your many essays this week, we can tell you that our youth are full of great ideas and they are brimming with enthusiasm to keep our hobby alive well into the future, Ewing concluded. He thanked Amateur Radio Digital Communications for supporting this year's prizes. The American National Amateur Radio Society, ARRL, has been reporting on the bilateral events taking place in the UK and the USA to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the successful amateur radio transatlantic tests. 160 meter band operators can revel in two opportunities in December that promise to fill the airwaves with activity to test skills and stations on that band. The events take place a century after the transatlantic tests of the 1920s, which ushered in the dawn of international amateur radio communication. 
The annual ARRL 160m contest began at 22 hours UTC on Friday, December the 3rd and ended at 15.59 UTC on Sunday, December the 5th. This 42-hour Morse code-only contest is more similar to the original transatlantic tests. This contest attracted a good crowd and presented a challenge to operator skills and station performance. The Radio Society of Great Britain is planning to activate special call signs to commemorate the centenary of the tests. Stations from the UK and Crown Dependencies will use up to seven different call signs, each having a 6-X-ray X-ray suffix. G6 for England, GD6 for the Isle of Man, GI6 for Northern Ireland, GJ6 for Jersey, GM6 for Scotland, GU6 for Guernsey and GW6 for Wales. In addition, listen for UK stations appending the suffix stroke 2 Zulu echo to their station call sign. Use of this commemorative suffix has been authorised for use from December the 1st to the 26th by Ofcom, the UK's communications regulator. On December the 12th, and not to be confused with the ARRL 160 metre contest we've just been mentioning, the ARRL and the RSGB will jointly sponsor a 160 metre transatlantic centenary QSO party. This six-hour event will run from 02 to 08 hours UTC. The event coincides with the 100th anniversary of the successful second transatlantic tests. Participating stations will operate only using Morse code, that's sometimes known as CW, standing for Continuous Wave, and they'll be trying to contact the two official call sign activations, Whiskey 1 Alpha Whiskey in America and Golf Bravo 2 Zulu Echo in the UK. At times, these stations may listen for callers 1 kHz above their transmitting frequency to shift the pile-up from their own transmit frequency. They may also periodically ask for DX callers only, that's long distance calls. The exchange is call sign and signal report. During the QSO party, ARRL will activate Whiskey 1 Alpha Whiskey from Newington, Connecticut. The RSGB will activate GB2 Zulu Echo with help from a team of stations, including members of the GMDX Group of Scotland, sharing the operating duties. GB2 Zulu Echo commemorates the callsign of Paul Godley to Zulu Echo, who was sent by the ARRL to the UK to lead the second transatlantic test in December 1921. Whiskey 1 Alpha Whiskey will be active for all six hours. Stations operating as GB2 Zulu Echo will follow this schedule. At 02 hours UTC, they'll be operating from the commemorative station at Ardrossan in Scotland. From 03 hours, the signal will come from GM3 Yankee Tango Sierra. At 04 hours, you'll hear Golf Mike Zero Golf Alpha Victor operating the call sign. From 05 hours UTC, Mike Mike Zero Zulu Bravo Hotel takes up their turn. At 06 hours UTC, the call sign will be in use by Mike Mike Zero Golf Papa Zulu. And from 07 hours UTC, the signal will come from GM4 Zulu Uniform Kilo. And GM4 ZUK will operate until 08 hours UTC or until the band closes at sunrise. The GMDX Group will award a quaich, a traditional Scottish drinking cup representing friendship, to the first stations in North America and the UK to complete contacts with both Whiskey One Alpha Whiskey and GB2 Zulu Echo during the QSO party. A commemorative certificate will be available for download. Participants will not have to submit logs. The official logs from W1AW and GB2ZE will be used to determine the winners and for the issue of certificates. For additional details, you can visit www.arrl.org forward slash transatlantic or go to rsgb.org forward slash main forward slash activity forward slash transatlantic hyphen tests. ARRL Northwestern Division Assistant Director Phil Kane, K2ASP, of Beaverton, Oregon, became a silent key on November 24th. An ARRL Life member, he was 84. An FCC engineer, Kane rose to the post of FCC San Francisco District Director and administered many ham radio and commercial license exams during his nearly 30 years there. He was a registered professional engineer in several jurisdictions. Active as an amateur radio emergency service volunteer, Kane was a senior life member of the IEEE, 
a member of the Society of Broadcast Engineers and National Association of Radio and Telecommunications Engineers. Kane earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the Cooper Union School of Engineering, and he went to work for the U.S. Air Force. He also held a degree in system engineering from UCLA. While working for the FCC, he earned a law degree. After retiring from the commission, Kane worked as a consultant. In the mid-1960s, Kane served briefly in Israel's Ministry of Communications as a regulatory engineer before going to work for the FCC. Meanwhile, Virginia Section Manager Joe Palsa, K3WRY, of North Chesterfield, Virginia, passed on December 7th. An ARRL Life member, he was 80. Palsa was appointed Virginia Section Manager in February 2015 and had since won elections in his own right. A radio amateur for more than 50 years, he also served as the Virginia State Government Liaison. Palsa held a Ph.D. in Electronics Technology and was a life member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. He enjoyed researching and designing ham equipment and building projects including some specialized military applications on electromagnetic compatibility, electromagnetic interference, and electromagnetic pulse. His professional experience included design, product development, and application engineering support, as well as positions in senior sales and marketing and senior executive management. During 2014, he served as president of the Richmond Amateur Radio Club. In past years, he has held ARRL field organization positions as official bulletin station, official observer, and official emergency station. Active in the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, he received two ARRL Public Service Awards. PASA enjoyed DXing, contesting, and public service communication. With the new Omicron variant and other COVID-19 uncertainties, precluding an in-person gathering for the second year. The 23rd Annual Ham Radio University Educational Conference will be held as a virtual event again this year. Scheduled for Saturday, January 8th from 1300 to 2000 UTC as an online go-to-webinar video conference. Advanced registration is required and begins on December 20th. Ham Radio University 2022 will be adding five forums this year for a total of 19 presentations by experts in a broad range of amateur radio activities, including amateur radio emergency communications, basics of HF operating, ham radio contesting and DXing, communicating through amateur radio Earth satellites, software-defined radios, HF and VHF digital communications, parks on the air, Skywarn, cables and connectors, and using Raspberry Pi computers in amateur radio. Online attendees will be able to ask questions of the presenters. Founded by Phil Lewis, N2MUN, now a silent key, Ham Radio University also will serve as the online convention of the ARRL New York City Long Island section. And as in past years, participation in Ham Radio University 2022 is free, with an optional donation of $5 suggested. Additional information is online, including the schedule of forums and advanced registration starting December 20. Listeners to very low frequencies, known as VLF, will be familiar with the steady pulsed signal on 77.5 kHz. Delta Charlie Foxtrot 77 is a German longwave time signal and standard frequency radio station. Standard frequency stations have extremely accurate carrier frequencies, which can be relied upon for many scientific purposes, such as the synchronization of clocks. DCF-77 started service as a standard frequency station on the 1st of January 1959. In June 1973, date and time information was added. Its primary and backup transmitter are located at Meinflingen, about 25 kilometers southeast of Frankfurt in Germany. The transmitter generates a nominal power of 50 kilowatts, of which about 30 to 35 kilowatts can be radiated via its T antenna, making it a very efficient system. Most of our own HF antennas would not achieve such low losses.
Most radio clocks and watches in Europe, as well as many industrial applications, rely on its accurate time signals. Its official range is 2,000 kilometers, making it an interesting propagation tool. Last week, it was announced that the service will remain on air until at least 2031. And our thanks go to the Irish Radio Transmitter Society for this information. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency will begin receiving applications later this month for astronaut candidates to be part of NASA-helmed lunar exploration program called Artemis. According to the publication Space News, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency plans to assign astronauts to long-term work either aboard the International Space Station, the Japanese experiment module attached to it, or to NASA's lunar orbit outpost known as Gateway. The application window opens on December 20th and will close on March 4th of 2022. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency does not expect to release the names of successful candidates before February of 2023. Part of the recruitment effort will focus on attracting female candidates, since Japan presently has no female astronauts active in the nation's space program. President of Switzerland's amateur radio body, the USKA, Willy Vollenvida, HB9 Alpha Mike Charlie, recently attended a fab lab in Zug. What is a fab lab? Well, Wikipedia says that a fab lab, which is sometimes known as a makerspace, is an open workshop with the aim of giving private individuals and individual traders access to modern manufacturing processes for the construction of individual items. Typical devices are 3D printers, laser cutters, high-precision milling machines, and presses for deep drawing in order to be able to process different materials and work pieces. With access to these devices, you can make almost anything. The first Fab Lab was initiated by Neil Gershenfeld at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2002 and founded the rapidly growing maker movement worldwide. There are currently around 25 Fab Labs in Switzerland alone. You can find them by looking at fablab.ch. In addition to the electronics and programming part, many amateur radio projects also require mechanical work, for which hams often lack the expensive processing machines. The use of existing and accessible equipment is therefore obvious. In return, many fab labs are interested in the electronics and ICT know-how of radio amateurs. It's a win-win situation for both. A member of the fab lab Zug team is Heinz Hotel Bravo 9 Bravo Papa Hotel. As part of a construction project carried out with his local Lucerne Amateur Radio Club, parts of a magnetic loop antenna were manufactured by the project members in the fab lab at Zug. The finished antenna is now part of an exhibition at the Fab Lab, and Heinz explained the construction in detail to the guests at the recent opening. That's effective public relations for our hobby. The Swiss Amateur Radio Society strives for nationwide partnerships with Fab Labs to enable radio amateurs to access manufacturing facilities, especially in the context of USKA projects. They are looking for radio amateurs who already have relationships with Fab Labs or would like to build up relationships for radio amateurs. Contact Vili, Hotel Bravo 9, Alpha Mike Charlie, by going to www.uska.ch. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. When you were knee-high to a grasshopper, did you undergo a life-changing experience that influenced your future career? Thomas Hood, NW7US did. Thomas has been a shortwave enthusiast since 1973. He was first licensed as a ham in 1990 at age 25. In the mid-1990s, Thomas established the first civilian space weather propagation website, hfradio.org, which later spawned sunspotwatch.com. Thomas's nw7us.us website was launched June 1999. Today, nw7us.us is a video resource for shortwave propagation, solar cycle information, and space weather. Thomas has contributed to the space weather propagation column in CQ magazine for more than 20 years and for Spectrum Monitor since 2014. A product of the Pacific Northwest, Thomas resides today in Fayetteville, Ohio. Rains Hapali, KC9RP, spoke with Thomas Hood recently about Solar Cycle 25 
and the game-changing afternoon he experienced in 1973 at age eight. In the early 1970s, I discovered my parents' medium wave, long wave, short wave, and FM four band Sony portable radio. And I secreted that out into a nearby large field living in Fort Missoula, Missoula, Montana. So there was this really large field owned by the university. I went out to the middle of that to be away from prying eyes, and I started playing around with the radio to figure out what it was and what it did. And I started hearing boops and beeps and scratches and different sounds. And I played around for that afternoon. Came across this hypnotic pulsing I later found out was WWV. National Institute of Standards and Technology Time. This is radio station WWV, Fort Collins, Colorado. Broadcasting on internationally allocated standard carrier frequencies of 2.5, 5, 10, 15, and 20 megahertz. Providing time of day, standard time intervals, and other related information. At the time, I was listening to that, mesmerized. So I would lay on my back, look up at the lazy cloud drifting overhead and I listened at great length I started hearing somebody reading off something called a solar terrestrial report and that had me mesmerized and they talked about sunspots and geomagnetic conditions terrestrial on the seas for 25 April follow solar flux 83 and the boulder index 6 repeat solar flux 83 and the boulder index 6 the boulder k index 1200 gt on 26 April was 3 repeat 3 Solar terrestrial conditions for the last 24 hours follow. Solar activity was very low. The geomagnetic field was quiet to unsettled. Forecast for the next 24 hours follows. Solar activity will be very low. The geomagnetic field will be quiet to unsettled. And I had no clue what they were talking about. I scratched my head and I went, sunspots? Spots on the sun? And thus began a lifelong exploration and love affair with space weather because I also at that time discovered shortwave, my love affair with ionospheric propagation. The moment I could get to a library, I started trying to find books on sunspots and shortwave, discovered some unique things that were way above my head but still had me mesmerized found out that there was this thing orbiting Earth called Skylab and that they had an artificial eclipse and that they were studying the sun and solar flares and things. And little by little, I began to understand what I was hearing and what was being talked about. Fast forward. I started in the U.S. Army Signal Corps in the 1980s and did a little bit of a deeper dive into what was going on with signals and propagation. And finally, by the time I exited the Army, I was able to get my FCC novice license. That was my time to start learning when I transmit, where does my signal go, how does my signal get there, and that sort of thing. Around the mid-1990s, I started a web page on space weather with current conditions, and I had programmed scripts behind the scene to gather information from government websites sites and collate that into reports on space weather and propagation. So I was the first civilian space weather propagation website ever on the web. Still going to this point, sunspotwatch.com is the current domain, sunspotwatch.com. At about 2000, 2001, George Jacobs, the editor with CQ Magazine that wrote on propagation, George reached out to me along with Rich Moseson of CQ Magazine asking me if I would like to take over George's column. So I began in 2001 as the contributing editor of, I'm calling it the space weather propagation column because I've begun to educate a lot more on the mechanics behind propagation, especially ionospheric propagation and how space weather has such a high impact on it. Then about 2014, the Spectrum Monitor magazine, which is kind of an evolution of sorts from the Monitoring Times, they reached out and I also began writing 
finding propagation columns with space weather information in the Spectrum Monitor TSM. So I'm actually writing at the moment for two magazines, CQ and the Spectrum Monitor. I do occasional space weather videos, as well as videos on ham radio and propagation antennas and, and different things related to that on my YouTube channel, which is under my call sign, which is November Whiskey, number seven, Uniform Sierra, NW7US. I got that call sign as a vanity call when I got to my amateur extra license because the AFCC assigned me N7 Papa Mike Sierra, N7 PMS. <laughs> and that did not work very well whenever I got onto like 75 meters and had discussions that took 10 minutes of just joking before anything else could be done. I was living in the Seattle area and I grew up in Montana. So the whole Pacific Northwest, the Northwest region of the United States, even up into Alaska, that's my chomping ground from childhood. I just love the seven region. The FCC call areas are divided into regions numbered zero through nine. The seven region is most of the West and Northwest of the United States. California is the six area. As I was researching vanity calls, the NW prefix was quite rare. I think this is like 2000 or 2001. So very, very few NWs out there. And I knew in certain contests, prefixes are a commodity. So I grabbed NW7 US because I wanted to promote the Northwest 7 region of the United States as my favorite area. And thus was born my now well-recognized call sign associated with my space weather writing and website and YouTube channel. So anyway, that's my YouTube channel is NW7US and you'll find me there. That's also my Twitter handle, of course. And there is another Twitter handle that I put out exclusively space weather information on an hourly basis. And that is Hotel Foxtrot, Romeo Alpha, Delta India, Oscar, then the word space and WX all as one word. And that is my outlet for live space weather and educational tweets and things like that. We are currently in solar cycle or sunspot cycle 25. Officially, they would call it a solar cycle. And then the number of consecutive since we first began recording them in the early 1700s. Sunspot cycles last an average of about 11 years from minimum through the peak to the next minimum. Now we're in the 25th recorded since the early 1700s. Each sunspot cycle varies in intensity and by intensity, we refer to the number of sunspots with a smooth value calculated monthly. So they calculate a mean average over a month of the highest reading of the day, and then they have a monthly number. And so the lowest activity of sunspots, we call that the solar minimum. And as a solar cycle or sunspot cycle revs up in energy level, that means more sunspots appear and they increase in number until the peak of that cycle. And then they begin to diminish in the number of sunspots seen on the visible side of the sun the sun facing Earth. We're at the very beginning of cycle 25. The last cycle 24 had its peak in February, March of 2014. And the smooth monthly value was 114.3. They forecast this cycle to be peaking at about 115 smooth average number. The prognosis is that would happen probably in July of 2025. However, each month since the beginning of this cycle, which was December 2019, statistically with the max monthly count of 34 sunspots, the minimum count being 1.8 sunspot regions, the ramp of the increase in activity is ahead of predicted schedule. They plot a forecasted rise and fall of the new cycle. And as they plot the actual numbers, we see that this sunspot cycle is increasing in activity more quickly than they anticipated. The solar scientists and forecasters correlate that to what they feel will actually translate to a stronger or a higher peak 
than anticipated. So instead of the 115 as the average and peak number in July of 2025, it could be anywhere from 120 to possibly 140. All of this, of course, is conjecture, but they do seem to be getting better at forecasting. And that's simply because we now have more data points. We have more satellites and spacecraft that are out there monitoring the sun from different perspectives, different instruments, and they've refined models by which they make these forecasts, just like terrestrial weather. The more data points you have and the better the models become, the more accurate your forecasts become. Well, space weather forecast is very young as a science. We've only been monitoring the sun on a daily basis for about 420 years, so it's a young science. And it wasn't until Skylab and since the 70s that we've actually begun detailed, intimate imagery of the sun to really understand its model and how we can base predictions on the observed. So it's getting better. I think we're probably going to find this cycle to be a moderate, possibly the same magnitude of cycle 24, or perhaps a little bit stronger. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. One, it means that the naysayers and doomsday people who predicted a repeat of the Maunder minimum, which was a period, a very extended, long period of time, the 1800s, when no sunspots appeared for many years in a row, we call that the Maunder minimum. These naysayers and doomsday preppers were thinking that maybe this cycle 25, because 24 was weaker than 23, they thought maybe 25 would be a dud and we see no sunspots at all and a repeat of the Maunder minimum with its climate change and ice age type of repercussions like the Thames River uh, freezing over for most of the year at the time. We don't have that happening now. At least it's not apparent that that's going to happen. We have a ramp up of the new cycle. It's following, generally speaking, the traditional rise activity and everything looks like on course to just a normal sunspot cycle. What that means for the amateur radio operators is that signals on the shortwave spectrum and low VHF spectrum are going to drastically improve, meaning we'll have worldwide propagation on bands from 20 meters on up through 6 meters and perhaps even 4 meters, which is low VHF. 6 meters is common worldwide, 4 meters in Europe as bands that amateurs can operate on. But generally speaking, the bands from 20 megahertz, the upper part of the shortwave spectrum on up through 30 megahertz, that slice of spectrum will see improved propagation simply because with the increase of sunspots, we have an increase of solar energy that impacts the Earth's ionosphere, creating the energy required to refract higher frequencies. The more energized the ionosphere, and we're namely talking about the F regions of the ionosphere, the more energized that region, the higher the frequency that's refracted as a signal enters the ionosphere, refracted back toward the Earth. And we anticipate, even with the sunspot maximum reaching 115, 120, that being a low to moderate amount of activity, we still expect the highest parts of the shortwave spectrum to greatly improve between now and maybe a year or two after the solar cycle max. And that concludes our first excerpt from Hap Holly KC9RP's interview with Thomas Hood, NW7US, a propagation and space weather columnist with CQ Magazine and Spectrum Monitor. Thomas established HFRadio.org, the first civilian space weather propagation website, in the mid-1990s. That website later spawned sunspotwatch.com. Thomas's website, nw7us.us, still serves as a video resource for shortwave propagation, solar cycle information, and space weather. We'll conclude HAP's conversation with Thomas in Rain Hamcast number 57, scheduled for posting Christmas Day. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, bidding you very 73. The board of the German National Amateur Radio Body, the DARC, once again denoted December the 5th as International Volunteer Day as an opportunity to thank their committed members for their work. The DARC said that the association would not exist without the commitment, cooperation and creativity of many active radio amateurs, so this is their way of saying thank you very much. 
4,494 voluntary radio amateurs are currently involved in the DARC. Together, they stand up for the amateur radio community and secure the future of amateur radio in Germany. By way of lectures, additional staffing, district representation and almost 1,000 local chapters, these volunteers inspire other people in the club and motivate them to engage in activities and radio operations. 272 women and 4,222 men maintain club life, protect amateur radio frequencies and look after radio hams in a total of 6,021 roles. An example of the dedication of volunteers is Paul Szymanski, Delta Foxtrot 4, Zulu Lima. He is the DARC Department Head for Contests and has been actively involved in various tasks across Germany for the DARC for over 40 years. On a regional level too, he's been a contest evaluator, a trainer, a local section chairman and QSL manager in the local regions of Wetzlar and Oruselsheim. Paul said that he was an old-school radio amateur and he loves radio operations. He commented that contact with other people is in the very foreground of amateur radio. DARC's International Volunteer Day takes place on December the 5th every year. This date is dedicated to citizens who volunteer with their free time. This day of appreciation was established by the United Nations, which aims to recognise and promote volunteer work, and it's been taking place since 1986. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Every year, professional and amateur tower climbers fall to their deaths. In most cases, these accidents were avoidable. Not too long ago, people in my community were shocked when a commercial tower climber fell to his death. According to our local paper, Jerry Trammell, 29 years old, not an amateur, of Southern Indiana, fell from an older style microwave reflector tower where he was working with another climber. They were painting the tower. There is no way to prevent all accidents. That's why they call them accidents. As a tower climber, we can reduce them by following some simple safety guidelines. No matter if you're climbing up or down, a simple climbing procedure can dramatically reduce the risk of falling. The cost for this added safety is a slower rate of climb. First off, use the proper commercial climbing belt and attachment gear. Secondly, always wear a commercial climbing shoulder harness. Join the harness to your belt. And lastly, use a similar strap from your harness and attach it to the tower, but always to a different placement on the tower from your belt. This way, no matter which one fails, the other one is more than strong enough to hold your weight and that of your gear and cargo. With a dual strap attachment, you can climb up or down with two straps and always be attached to the tower. Using this method, the only thing that can injure you is a total failure of the tower or a near direct lightning strike. This may slow your vertical movement, but ask yourself this question. If I misplace a clamp, can I flap my arms fast enough to slow my fall to a safe speed? Let's review this simple procedure one more time. You will use two climbing straps to attach to the tower. Always clamp these two straps to different places on the tower, never to the same tower part. From a standstill, unhook one strap and step up one or two rungs until the other strap is around your knees. Then clamp the first strap as high as you can reach. Now, reach down and unhook the lower strap. Step up until the now higher strap is about knee height and reach up and clamp on with the loose one. By using shoulder harness and waist belts and using this method, you will always be connected to the tower while climbing. Remember to follow the dual attachment safety rule while clamped onto the tower when you intend to let go of the tower and lean fully into your belt. Always clamp onto two different places. When using duplicate strap attachments, you effectively reduce the chances of a fatal fall by nearly half. That's a cheap and cost-effective insurance policy you can write for yourself. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. A key member of the WSJTX development group, where FT8 and other cutting-edge digital amateur radio technology has originated, has passed. Bill Somerville, G4WJS, was reported to have passed away earlier this week. 
He was in his mid-60s, and his death was unexpected. The development group founder, Joe Taylor, K1JT, called Somerville a dear friend and a very close colleague. Taylor said that Somerville was the first to join with him in 2013 to form a core development group for WSJTX, then in its digital infancy. Bill has been closely involved with WSJTX and related software projects ever since, Taylor said. Our free open source software could not have achieved its extensive worldwide popularity and influence in ham radio without Bill's essential contributions. Somerville collaborated with Taylor and Steve Frank, K9AN, the third member of the WSJTX development group, to author articles for QST and QEX about FT8 and other digital modes in the WSJTX suite. The trio won the October 2017 QST Cover Plaque Award. They also received the Dayton Hamvention Technical Achievement Award in 2020 and the ARRL Doug DeMaw W1FB Technical Excellence Award in 2021. Taylor said Somerville devoted countless hours to program support, patiently answering users' questions on WSJT-related forums. I have only started to think about the many ways in which I will miss Bill, not to mention how we will all miss his immense and positive impact on WSJTX and related projects, Taylor said. Professionally, Somerville was a software engineer who worked mainly as a C++ system software developer, as he explained on his QRZ profile. As an active radio amateur, he also applied his expertise to such projects as setting up a single operator to radio station and enhancing his station's automated processes. If you have a skill to share, an insight to explain, or some other contribution you'd like to make to the world's amateur radio community, you may want to offer a presentation at the next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, which is taking place on the weekend of March 12th and 13th. According to the QSO Today Virtual Hamcation organizer, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, along with the new year just around the corner, planning is already well underway for the next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. Hams and other presenters are being asked to consider sharing on various aspects of the hobby in which they have expertise. As you can see on the QSO Today website, the ongoing search is an international one, with hams being asked to present from around the world to thousands who attend the virtual two-day conference. Presentations are generally recorded for playback during the event, followed by a live question-and-answer period. Accommodations can be made for presentations in languages other than English. The QSO Today website has an online application for prospective speakers. If you wish to apply, visit the QSO Today website at www.qsotodayhamexpo.com slash speakercall.html. And finally this week, a Seattle, Washington area amateur radio club had its applications for non-commercial educational FM broadcast channels tossed out by the commission which told the club there were too many technical defects in the proposal. According to a report in Radio World, the Fort Ward Amateur Radio Club on Bainbridge Island had a number of issues that needed addressing, including what the FCC cited as failure to comply with interference treaty agreements between the United States and Canada. The FCC allows unsuccessful applicants to reapply with an amendment fixing the issues, provided they do so within 30 days of the rejection. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. 
This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio here on our network flagship repeater, K2RHI. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at TWIAR.net. We would like to take this opportunity to thank K2RHI for use of the repeater to bring the greater capital area amateur operators this informative weekly news service. And now, for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio Headquarters and our news team,